Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topics are rogue agents and terrorists. We're continuing in the theme of bad things that can happen if a country acquires nuclear weapons. But we're shifting focus slightly. Before, we were looking at accidents, the possibility of states engaging in an inadvertent nuclear war, or perhaps a country accidentally dropping a bomb on itself. This time, we're going to be looking at things that happen intentionally, but are not what the state itself wants, either due to rogue agents or terrorists. I have three different topics to focus on, so let's get to it. First up is the possibility of unauthorized launches. The United States faced a problem at the beginning of the Cold War. Nuclear weapons were becoming easier to use, and they were deployed under the Strategic Air Command. In principle, the president was supposed to authorize the use of those nuclear weapons. In practice, however, there was a problem with that. The president didn't really have command control over the weapons. Whoever was in charge of the Strategic Air Command did. At the time, that was General Thomas Power. And there was a concern, not specifically necessarily to Thomas Power, but in general, that whoever may be in charge of the Strategic Air Command could go crazy and decide to start firing off nuclear weapons without the authorization of the president. This type of problem could compound. Imagine you're the Soviet Union and you see a bunch of nuclear missiles coming into your country. The first thought is not going to be that there's a rogue general in the United States that's doing this. The first thought is going to be that this is the official policy of the United States, and you're going to mount a counterattack. Well, now all of a sudden, we spiraled into an accidental nuclear war. The U.S. tapped Sandia National Laboratory to come up with a solution to this problem. The mitigation strategies they created are now known as Permissive Action Links, or PALS for short. Permissive action links are a set of technologies and protocol designed precisely to reduce the risk of a rogue agent firing a nuclear weapon and ensure that if the United States launches a nuclear attack, it is because the president decided to do so. You've probably heard of part of this system before. This is a relatively innocent looking photo of President Obama and Chuck Schumer pointing to something in the distance. But I want you to focus your eyes on the background to the right. Do you see what I'm looking at? There's a man standing there with some sort of suitcase. Well, that's actually the nuclear football in his hands. The nuclear football contains, among other things, the U.S. nuclear launch codes, as well as battle plans in the event of a nuclear war. The suitcase is always nearby the president. That's because timing is important. If the U.S. were to be the target of a preemptive nuclear attack, there's not much of a window for the U.S. to be able to authorize a retaliation. As a result, a fun game you might try playing on your own sometime is if you ever see a photo of the president or a video of the president, try finding the nuclear football. Oftentimes you will be able to spot it somewhere in the background. Not all presidents prefer keeping the launch codes within the football. Some instead would rather have them on their body at all times. This created a bit of an incident during the Ronald Reagan assassination attempt. When Reagan was shot, he was transported to the hospital for emergency surgery. And it being an emergency, the surgeons didn't really care about what was going on around him. They tried to get his clothes off as quickly as possible. But by doing that, they were actually removing the launch codes from him. It wasn't until later that they found the discarded launch codes in his shoes. Now, to be clear, there were still some stopgap measures here. The launch code card actually has a whole bunch of different launch codes on it, and only one of them is real. The president knows which one, but you and I do not. So if you were to pick up the launch codes, somehow get on a phone call with nuclear commanders, convince them that you were the president of the United States, convince them also that the Secretary of Defense was verifying that you were the president of the United States, and then gave them a launch code, there's a good chance that upon receiving the launch code and trying to verify the launch code, the commanders would realize that something was amiss and disregard the order. 
let's talk a little bit more about those authorization procedures. These in particular are for Minuteman missiles. Imagine that the president gives an order to launch nuclear weapons, it's verified by the Secretary of Defense, and they give the authorization code from that card. What happens next is that two operators receive the order. Each of them has a key to a special safe. They go to that safe and use their keys to unlock it. You need both of the locks undone, otherwise the safe won't come open. Inside the safe is a sealed envelope. They open that sealed envelope, and inside is an authorization code. The operators match the authorization code to what came in over the order. If there is in fact a match, then they proceed to the next step. They'll go to the launching station, and with another set of keys, two of them again, one for each, they will put their keys into those keyholes and turn them at the same time. It's critical that the keys are actually turned at the same time. This is another safety protocol. Think about why. Imagine if I'm crazy and I just wanna really start a nuclear war. Well, I could potentially kill the other operator and take his key. And if the keyholes were close enough together, I would put both of them into the launch station, turn them at the same time and initiate the launch. But by design, the keyholes are far enough apart that it's impossible for a single individual to turn them at the same time. And on top of all of this, you need to have two different sets of operators in two different locations execute this operation. If only one set of operators does this, it's not good enough. The Minutemen won't fire. Systems like this did more than just reduce the concerns of what would happen if an agent like Thomas Power went rogue. It also gave the U.S. confidence that it could deploy more nuclear weapons in more places and still have the president and the president alone make the decision to fire a nuclear weapon. Here we see a 1962 memo about permissive links allowing the United States to deploy nuclear weapons to more NATO countries. And you'll remember that U.S. foreign nuclear deployments eventually became fairly widespread. Interestingly, the United States shares its PAL technology with others. If you think about it, this actually makes sense. The United States does not want to have an accidental nuclear war. And if it's only shoring up its half of things, well, there's another half that could still cause a problem. And so in fact, Russia has similar sorts of technology, and you can see the Russian version of the football here on the left. And this became very important at the end of the Cold War. As you'll recall, when the Soviet Union fell, four separate countries had nuclear weapons on their soil. Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. Despite that, only Russia had the ability to actually use those nuclear weapons. And that's because of command and control technology. Yes, there were weapons sitting in Ukraine, but no one in Ukraine had the launch codes to use them. They were always sitting in Moscow. And it's the lack of command and control in Pakistan that's a serious concern. The United States regularly spends millions of dollars every year to try to shore up the Pakistani government because there is a concern that if the Pakistani government were to fall, then multiple different rogue agents might have access to the nuclear weapons and the ability to use them. And that's something that's very scary. Speaking of Pakistan, the next topic to discuss is proliferation assistance. One concern that you have to have when a country develops nuclear weapons is the creation of a new weak link in the non-proliferation regime. If Pakistan develops nuclear weapons, for example, they're training individuals with the ability to produce nuclear weapons who might then go elsewhere. Proliferation could beget proliferation. That's exactly what happened with Pakistan. AQ Khan was the father of the Pakistani bomb, and after he was done with that program, he created a nuclear black market. Verified assistance went to Libya, Iran, and North Korea. And we know that North Korea eventually went on to assist Syria with its program. All of this is to say, if you're a part of the non-proliferation regime, you might want to nip this problem in the bud and make sure that a country doesn't develop nuclear weapons in the first place. Because without a nuclear weapons program in Pakistan, you don't get AQ Khan and you don't get the AQ Khan network, and you don't have proliferation perhaps filtering down as easily to these other countries. 
The last topic is nuclear terrorism. We can think about the problem of nuclear terrorism on a couple of levels. The worst level is a terrorist group developing a nuclear weapon on its own. Fortunately, this is rather unlikely. If you don't know what you're doing all that well, it takes miles of building and an enormous amount of energy to be able to develop enough fuel for a nuclear weapon to work. Terrorist groups don't really have that sort of infrastructure or funding to do. More efficient designs like uranium centrifuges are cheaper, faster, have a smaller footprint, and require less energy to operate. But still, again, this is a large capital expense and not really the type of thing that a terrorist group is going to be able to do. Furthermore, the super destructive thermonuclear weapons require tritium, and usually you get tritium out of a nuclear reactor, which is something that a terrorist group, again, probably isn't going to be operating. Compounding the problem, both the international community and specific countries spend an enormous amount of money and effort trying to remove and destroy terrorist groups. This means that the average life of a terrorist group is relatively short, and thus a terrorist group investing in a long-term project isn't usually a good idea. A more plausible concern is that a terrorist group receives fissile material rather than make it itself. This is in part why it was very important to secure and remove the missiles in Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine, even if those countries did not have command and control over them. Someone could go into one of those facilities and take apart a nuclear weapon and get access to the fissile material. Well, a terrorist group would find that fissile material very valuable and might try buying it. Once in possession of fissile material, the terrorist group would have to create a nuclear device. Highly enriched uranium by itself is not going to create an explosion. However, we've talked about how the gun-style bomb is relatively straightforward to build. You take a donut of highly enriched uranium, you have a conventional explosive send that donut down a tube at fast speed, and it hits a donut hole, causing the mass to become supercritical. You'll recall also that the US was so confident in this design and it was so straightforward to build that they didn't even test it before detonating it over Hiroshima. It is plausible that a terrorist group, which specializes often in explosives, could create something like this. An implosion-style weapon would be more difficult. These require that the conventional explosive surrounding the pit of fissile material all goes off at the same time. And if you're just slightly imprecise with it, you're not going to have the nuclear explosion work as you intend. Even if a terrorist group can't figure out how to get a nuclear device to work properly, possession of fissile material is scary on its own. If you have a conventional explosive go off near fissile material, well, you're going to send radiation all over the place. And if you take that kind of dirty bomb and set it off in New York, you're going to create all sorts of havoc. This is also why the United States is so concerned about securing radioactive waste from nuclear reactors. You don't need fissile material to create a dirty bomb. You just need radioactive substances. So if you get a canister like this that's full of radioactive material and you put a bomb inside of it, well, you're still going to have radiation go all over the place. In summary, there is a risk of unauthorized nuclear attacks. This is part of the reason why the non-proliferation regime wants to reduce the number of states that develop nuclear weapons, and it's going to play directly into the nuclear negotiations that we'll study later. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.